Welcome everyone. Um, it's my honor to introduce the keynote speaker for this session, Professor Manuela Veloso from CMU. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about these uh, symbiotic uh, mobile, so the clock is not moving. The, it's good, right? So. <laughs> Uh, symbiotic mobile robot autonomy in human environments. And I do uh, want you to see that I am a professor of computer science, but also I have appointments in robotics, uh, machine learning, mechanical and electrical engineering. And the reason why I think this is uh, in some sense uh, uh, important is because in fact the research I do is on AI and robotics. So it involves students from all these different departments and uh, their, inter their interactions and their integrations. So. so the robots that we have been working on are what we call cobots, these collaborative robots. And the collaborative robots, one of the things that uh, mostly uh, characterizes my work is the fact that these robots uh, have goals and they perform tasks. So it's robots that have a function and they are not just learning the maps or they are not just navigating the environment for the sake of navigating, but they are really like uh, executing tasks in the environment. So they go to locations, they deliver messages, they escort people, they transport objects, and they also have something that I really think it, we are proud of, which is this semi-autonomous uh, telepresence. So we can use them as telepresence robots, but instead of joysticking them all from a remote location, users can in fact just tell them where to go, and eventually they go there by themselves, and then they remote control only in the particular room where they want to, uh, to work. So, I'm surprised the clock is not going down. It, that's fine. Oh, there we go. I now I feel better because because now I am running against the time. <laughs> Otherwise, I would just like free speech. Okay. So now let me show you indeed this robot moving at CMU. And what matters here is for you to appreciate the fact that this robot is capable of moving in environment and stopping at the right place. And the reason why it stops there, it's not because it eventually sees the door, but it actually it's because it does have a localization algorithm that allows it to know the X, Y location and knowing where it is. So we task the robots to actually uh, perform uh, tasks in a map, in, and the robots go and uh, are scheduled paths to accomplish multi multiple tasks. Uh, the algorithm for scheduling is really beautiful. It includes transfers, so the robots can meet in a point and transfer objects from one to the other and then optimize their routes like that. And I invite you to come to the talk tomorrow of Ryan Colton, which will uh, go in further depth in this algorithm. So in terms of perception, these robots have a laser, range, range finder, and a connect. And I will spend, uh, my talk is going to have three parts, and I'll spend a little bit of the, work, the time explaining about localization and navigation, how they do it. And then I will actually spend some time on uh, some uh, tasks they do in terms of data collection, and finally on interaction with humans. So all the work I'm going to spend now talking is about uh, the work that my student Joy Deep Bisvas did, and he's a, a genius. He has these papers, and if you get a, a way of like um, knowing him, he is great. So here is like the localization algorithm that gets a map, and the robot is uncertain about its location, filters an image, trying to find planes in the image. Uh, very efficiently by sampling that large 3D cloud that the Connect produces, ignores humans because they are not planar, and it's capable of identifying the walls, and then when the walls match with the map, the robot is very certain about its location. So this robot really is a depth-based localization algorithm that basically only uses depth to map its uh, its perception into the map. And here is the robot navigating in the environment in very different uh, situations in which it's a large, cor it's a narrow corridor, it's a very large hallway, 
and then it actually uh, can even go through very, very bright uh, glass bridges, and uh, it does uh, all these navigation in our ninth floor uh, building uh, autonomously, and actually it has traversed close to 1,000 kilometers as we speak. And uh, the, one of the proofs that is really well localized is what happens at the end of this bridge in which the robot knows that there is a transition from wood to carpet and needs to slow down. And look how beautiful it slows down exactly at the right moment. And then it continues its navigation uh, by itself. I need to say that the reason why we have this video is because I actually follow the robot. But usually, we don't have any video because the robots just go by themselves. So. Okay, now I'm going to explain one of the new things that goes beyond this uh, uh, localization algorithm, which is the fact that, as you, as you probably know, or uh, as I tell you, the robot was very reliable in navigating in corridors. But when it, you face these uh, environments that have a lot of like uh, varying and static features, like chairs and all sorts of, of, of difficult features that are not these uh, walls, the robot cannot navigate there, or it actually gets lost much more easily. So Joy Dibb's thesis introduced this concept of non-Markov localization, in which the first thing he contributes is the classification of the observations of the robot into long-term features, uh, short-term features, and dynamic features. And uh, these uh, long-term features provide the static features of the environment, and the short-term features provide these local and relative correlations, and the dynamic features are ignored for, uh, in terms of localization. And the beautiful thing of the approach is that you maintain episodes. It's non Markovian because you, rem you remember, as I'll explain in a second, all the path of the episode to maximize the position, uh, uh, the op optimize the, the better estimation of the position of the robot, of the pose of the robot. So here is an example of a laser, a laser scan in a varying environment, and you get all these observations. And what happens is that eventually you can compute what's static by really just get your map and map your observations to the long-term features. And then you remain with these features that are not in the map. And if for two poses of the robot, they actually are in the same place and you can map them, you call them like short-term features. If by any chance between the two poses of the robot, the features don't match, you call them dynamic features. And the robot navigating in our environments is always classifi classifying these observations into long-term, short-term, or dynamic features. We introduced, uh, in uh, Joy Deep in his thesis, introduced this varying, the new, a new representation for this problem, which we call the varying graphical network, in which we have these fixed nodes but in this uh, dynamic base net, we include also varying nodes that actually uh, have a varying correlation and change over time. So here is an example of a variable graphical network, but let me just show you this one, which is, in fact, what is the core of his, uh, of his uh, algorithm, is that you actually uh, while you detect, when you detect these short-term features, you actually identify uh, the transition in which the short-term features, some of them don't appear anymore, like when the robot turns a corridor. It should not be remembering more the chairs and the tables and the short-term features it saw in the previous stretch of the corridor. So you can define this memory or this non-Markovian localization within, within episodes. So the algorithm uh, is capable of identifying this is a new episode, and then it doesn't do the correlations with anything of the previous episode. So this is very important because it allows us to break also this uh, amount of, of memory that the robot can use to localize. And here we frame this belief on the pose of the robot in terms of a cost function. And we do not represent its non-Markovian localization as a particle filter, but actually as a cost function that we then maximize and we solve uh, to find the maximum last likelihood estimate of your positions of the, N, the, the most consistent localization with the N last observations, with the N last state. So you actually are constantly maximizing to better match 
what you've seen over N observations and your N state. And it's a, it's a really a very, I mean, you can see the papers and the, an ICRA paper and a, um, uh, you can see how beautiful this uh, localization performs in terms of, of the accuracy of the localization of the robot. Here is like uh, some results of an benchmark, but I'll let you, but where you can find the long term, the short term, and the dynamic features beautifully in an environment not previously known. And here is the robot, for example, navigating at NYU, where I was on sabbatical and the robot was there, with all these short-term features like those cubicles and were not in the map, and it just uh, is capable of using them all for navigation due to this non-Markovian localization. So, and it uh, beautifully moves with different lighting conditions, you name it, and uh, it's a very, very robust algorithm and, and uh, joy deep is to credit about this, and here is his picture again. So this was the first part of my uh, talk, and now I will tell you about something also very interesting, and in some sense obvious, but I believe quite novel for mobile robots, which is this concept that we are using our robots to uh, collect environmental data. So what happens is that uh, when people say robots will take jobs out of people and so forth. What happens is that us humans, we have a very limited cap uh, capability of knowing our XY position in this room precisely. So unless I have kind of a measuring tape, I don't know how far I am from that wall with an error of inches or centimeters, while a robot beautifully knows where it is in the building. And so what, uh, what we did at CMU, is that we have the robot traverse these corridors and measures Wi-Fi uh, signal strength in every single point of the building. So even every pose, we can uh, task the robot to go and navigate. And while it navigates, it opportunistically creates these beautiful kind of data maps that then people can use them for resource allocation for Wi-Fi, and all sorts of mechanisms. But look at the robot as an environmental data collection uh, creature. And we have done uh, not Wi-Fi only, we have done temperature. The robot is capable of, of, of collecting the temperature of the building, the humidity, the relative humidity. And uh, it's uh, at different times of the day, as much that as you want, and uh, Richard has been, uh, so he's writing, uh, well, it's under submission, a paper that explains how to collect this data when both the sensors and the robot function at different frame rates, how do we actively send the robot to get data in regions that are not as well covered as others, and now becomes this concept that when you plan a route, for the robot to go and perform a task, take this book from Manuela's office to the lab, the robot has all these possible routes, and now it also maximizes, optimizes towards acquiring data about the environment if someone tasked it to also acquire the data. So in some sense, we, we have, it's a new kind of, or a new kind of way of looking at these autonomous robots performing these additional tasks because they know where they are so well. Localization now, just not for the sake of obstacle avoidance and take the right route, but localization also for the, the purpose of generating these data maps extremely accurate. And, well, this is another one. And again, Wi-Fi uh, you, you, for different channels. We have done these all, in fact, facilities at Carnegie Mellon have thanked us for this. Finally, I'll tell you about the final aspect. You probably all know by now, if you have known me or if you have heard me before, that my robots ask for help. So my robot, so these cobot robots are in this symbiotic relationship in which they, when they have limitations, perceptual, cognitive, cognitive or actuation limitations, they just say, can you press the elevator button for me? And they are in this business of really asking for help for the things they can't make. And here is an example of the robot by the elevator, uh, beautifully needing to go up some uh, floor, and he just says, can you please push the elevator button, hold the door for me, and you can tell me like this, oh, Manuela, but why don't you have the cobot connected to the, to, to the elevator system, and it can press the button? That's fine. Uh, 
Maybe it will be able to press the button, maybe I can give it a little arm, but it might not be able to do something else. It might not be able to pick up the cup, it might not be able to open all the doors of the world. So the paradigm is really that our robots have inevitably limitations, and we better accept that and create autonomous robots that cope with such limitations. And here is the robot beautifully coming out of the, of the elevator and Stephanie just holding it. Finally, this human robot interaction in this symbiotic uh, autonomy enables a robot to actually also dialogue with humans in terms of speech. And if you tell the robot, go to the small size lab, so there is this issue about with, what is this uh, reference that the humans say to small size lab or Manuela's office or Sarah's office. What is all this about? Humans don't talk 4502, let alone they don't talk also X, Y location. They don't say go to these minus 22.35 comma 22, which is the representation that the robot uses. So we have to uh, learn and interact with humans to be able to actually capture these correlations. And there's the robot uh, does the multiple speech uh, recognizer outputs. It's capable of parsing. And it then learns new facts by asking the robot, the person, where to go. And let me show you this video and in which the robot, someone tells the robot, go to Sarah's office. The robot says, what do you mean by Sarah's office? These tell me a room number, and it says 7507. And then as soon as we uh, bridge the gap between these representations and the language and what the robot knows, the robot really plans its route and goes to the room. Every time in the future that you would say, go to Sarah's office, it's going to offer, do you mean 7507? And it's not going to ask anymore, what is? And here is an example. Go to the conference room. And, and here it says, in, according to me, in my knowledge base conference room, last time someone told me it's 7101. Is that what you mean? No, I meant 7501. And now the robot keeps these Bayesian updates of its knowledge base, which I'll explain in a second, about the two possible locations. Furthermore, it's actually a very beautiful uh, algorithm to ask the web. So this, you can say, bring a coffee to the lab and, and, and the robot says I don't know what this is I'm going to ask the web what's the probability of finding this object coffee in the locations I know namely office kitchen printer room what is that and it's capable of actually finding and it, the human says go to the kitchen and the robot happily says am I supposed to go to the kitchen yes and it goes to the kitchen, and eventually at the kitchen, as usual in its symbiotic way, it cannot pick up any objects, gets to the kitchen, and it says, can you please put the object coffee in my basket so I can take it to the lab? And a person generously puts the, office, the, the object coffee in the basket and says, I'm going to the lab, and that's what it does. So the robot is capable of interleaving what it can do, what it can't do, updates its knowledge base. Here is a snapshot of the knowledge base, the real knowledge base of Cobot. The things it knows, you can see here, like the small size lab, the small size web, the small fries lab, the small size labs. This is all the speech recognition that gets grounded or matched to 7412, which is the real map. And again, for objects, coffee, lunch, munch, bunch, this must be me speaking, you know, it gets all these different, <laughs> these bad <laughs> interpretations. So anyway, in conclusion, I told you about three aspects about these autonomous robots, which is really my passion, is to make them completely autonomous, nobody needs to follow them, they do it everything by themselves, and they're capable of handling all these environments. One is the fact that they are in this episodic non-mark of localization that allows them to move in much more varying spaces. They can do this data collection, and they actually can interact and learn from humans. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. In the life of a human or a robot, 
there are some situations where it can be extremely critical to be able to find objects fast. And this is exactly why I would like to talk about the prior assisted propagation of spatial information for object search. This is worked together with uh, two of my students that unfortunately cannot be here. The idea is if somebody tells you that the toilet paper is under the sink, you might not think it's under this sink because this sink is in the kitchen and you know that usually toilet paper is not stored in the kitchen. If you're confronted with this sink, you may say, okay, it's under the sink, so therefore it must be in this drawer because I don't really see it. Or if you see a sink like this in the bathroom, you immediately see there is no toilet paper and this might change your opinion about the first sink and you might go into the kitchen to look for the toilet paper. The idea is here that there are a number of different sources of information that we need to integrate to be efficient in, in search. One of them is scene structure, so how are the, the rooms arranged, what's the furniture, where does it stand. Another one is domain knowledge. I know that usually toilet paper is stored in the bathroom. Physical constraints. I know a table cannot be put into a drawer, so I don't need to look there. Logical consistency. If an object is in one place, it cannot be in another place or search history. If I have not found the object at some particular place, I don't need to fantasize it to be in this place. So all of these sources of information interact. And this is a challenge. Right? This is the challenge that we're, that we're confronting in this paper. We're devising an approach to do probabilistic reasoning based on factor graphs, where we derive a probability distribution for the most likely location of an object, taking into account all these different sources of information. We apply this. Um, to, to an example setting of this, of this uh, apartment with uh, five rooms, um, 35 pieces of furniture, 51 different objects. And we, using these factor graphs, derive these probability distributions over where the object, where the robot should look first. This process of deriving this probability distribution takes less than a second and um, you know, can easily be extended to all kinds of other uh, settings. In general, I think the approach that we're presenting is an approach to combine multiple sources of information into sort of a reasoning mechanism based on graphical models over large domains. Um, and Sebastian, who was the second author, um, gave me this picture to explain why he unfortunately couldn't be here. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Lars Kunze. I'm from the University of Birmingham and this is joint work uh, together with KTH. Uh, our work is about combining spatial and, uh, sorry, top-down and bottom-up processing for scene understanding. So the, the problem we are interested in, in uh, is how can robots understand or recognize uh, objects better in scenes? And we are in particular interested in scenes of office desks and the way the approaching the problem is we first identify object candidates within the scene and secondly we kind of assign class labels to those objects. Um, for this we are using a bottom-up perception pipeline which is based on a state-of-the-art object recognition framework which was developed by Aitor Aldemar and others uh, which is based on RGB sensor data and also uh, uses a classifier uh, that was trained on 3D CAD models from the web. So this is very good for looking at individual object scenes. However, in the context of long-term scenarios, the robot sees and perceives this scene all over again and again over weeks and months. So it builds up some expectations about what objects it will see and also in what configurations it will see them. And this is exactly the knowledge we are using in our second component, a top-down spatial reasoning component. So we learn the uh, geometric configurations of all these objects. For example, the keyboard is in front of a monitor, and we built a spatial model from this, and we are using this model then kind of to come up with a classification of the objects, of the identified object candidates. Finally, we, we put everything together in a unified framework. So we are using, uh, we start off with a bottom-up perception pipeline. So we identify object candidates in the scene come up with initial class labels for all the objects. We feed this then forward into our spatial reasoning component, uh, which computes the geometric properties and spatial relations between all candidates and comes up with a posterior distribution of all the class labels. 
So in experiments, we evaluated that we can achieve an average performance of roughly 60% of correctly classified objects in the scene if you're only using uh, the bottom-up uh, perception system. However, we can do significantly better if we are using our combined approach, which is proposed in this in this work. Uh, in future work, we are aiming at uh, closing closing this gap to feed the spatial background knowledge also in our perception system to improve uh, the perception system. Okay, I think this was everything for now, and I hope I see you with for more results in the interactive session. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, good afternoon. So I'd like to welcome you to my short presentation. I am Bogdan Moldovan, and this would be a short talk on learning relational affordance models for two arm robots. And this is done in collaboration with my supervisor at QU Leuven, uh, Professor Victor Rat. So first to start with the main motivation. So let's so let's say we're in a kitchen environment, a tabletop environment, which have multiple objects, and we're given some manipulation tasks, for example, to place the green object at the target location. But we also have a more advanced robot, like a two-arm robot, so it can use both of its arms to achieve the task. And as well, we want to extend uh, a previous affordance model, so the actions that the robot can do can have different effects on the objects and also depending on the spatial relations between the objects. So just to introduce that, so basically we model this with affordance models, which model the relations between object properties, uh, actions and effects. And it, in some previous research, we extended this to a relational domain. So the main idea is, well, objects normally can afford different things if they are, have different relations with other objects. So we can think like a remote control can afford to turn on a TV if the TV is in the room. If the TV is not in the room, it doesn't afford any action. And we did this extension with the help of statistical relational learning, so we can use first order lo logic to make generalizations and the uncertainty in perception can be represented with probabilistic facts. And then we can have this model in a probabilistic programming language, which can describe this relational affordance model. So basically what we did in this research is to extend this model to a two-arm robot in a kitchen environment. And then we try to, as much as possible, to approximate the two arm actions by a combination of the single arm actions. And so for this, we propose the following pipeline, which is divided into multiple steps and well, acquiring data, building the relational model, then with the help of logical rules, then we can extend it and then also consider, uh, uh, well, the specific tasks that the robot needs to and to do. So for example, and if you come to my interactive session, I'll have time to explain all the steps in the pipeline. So basically we gather data with one arm, then we build a linear, we learn the parameters of a Bayesian network, which we transfer to a relational domain, and then we model the two arms. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Olkan Patolo from Sabancı University, Istanbul, Turkey, and today I will talk about cognitive factories. Uh, cognitive factories is a new paradigm for achieving an ideal compromise between flexibility of human workshops and the cost effectiveness of mass production systems. A typical cognitive factory, just as one shown in the video, uh, consists of multiple workspaces, and within each workspace there are teams with multiple heterogeneous and reconfigurable rep robots. It's imperative that each team in the factory is endowed with high-level reasoning ab abilities, such as planning their own actions. Also, it's important that the teams collaborate with each other for efficient use of shared resources, such as their robots, to achieve a common goal. So, uh, there are many challenges in cognitive factories, and in this paper, uh, we, uh, our contributions are twofold. Uh, we show how to combine discrete task planning with continuous feasibility checks to find feasible uh, local level plans for each team. We also show how to find a coordination between teams and optimal coordination between teams. 
uh, to highlight some of our methods for local planning, uh, we introduce external atoms as a formal and modular interface for embedding continuous feasibility checks into high-level descriptions of actions. For example, we can embed probabilistic motion planning into logical action planning, symbolic planning, to find out plans that are guaranteed to be feasible. Uh, at the global level, uh, we find a coordination between teams using a semi-distributed approach. Uh, we introduce a mediator which asks yes-no queries to each team, collects, gathers information from each team, and then formulates the mathematical problem of coordination and solves it using a constraint satisfaction method. There are two aspects of this uh, approach that's important. One of them is privacy. The teams and the mediator do not know anything about each other's task goals, plans, or workspaces. And the other aspect is uh, parallelizability. Uh, basically, both the information gathering and query answering can be parallelized, and this allows the system to be very scalable. For example, we were able to solve a cognitive factory domain with 150 robots, 30 robot exchanges with a plan length of 30 within one minute on a standard PC. And uh, here we have a video of our augmented reality implementation of a cognitive factory using KUKA U-Bots and NXT robots. And this shows the feasibility of the approach and feasibility of the optimal global plans that we have uh, calculated. So here you see the exchange. Uh, please come and see us for more details of the approach in the interactive session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Today I'd like to talk to you about incorporating you know, dynamic constraints in automated design of simple machines. Robots have limited actuation capabilities. They have torque limits, they have limited link lengths. However, when they face challenges in the real world, we would like them to use objects in the environment as tools, just as humans can do. Simple machines are good examples of multi-object assemblies, which can provide mechanical leverage. For instance, a lever, an inclined plane, or a pulley can extend one's physical capabilities. We would like our robots to be able to do the same. So, uh, in this work, we focus on lever and fulcrum systems, where a lever is positioned on a fulcrum, and an agent can uh, apply force into the system to move a heavy load. In this example, we are looking at a, an autonomous system which can manipulate a lever. It will choose a lever from the available objects, place it on a, a triangle prism, and then position itself as well as degree of freedoms to actuate the system. Note that the output of what you are seeing now is the output of our algorithm. In this video, we can see the robot applying force into the system. The goal is to overturn the 50 kilogram object so it flips over. However, as the object gets heavier, it's a 100 kilogram load, the high level planner realizes a longer level is needed and it can adapt the configuration of the robot and the fulcrum so that it can achieve the task again. And we have also done some experiments on another domain where a door is blocked by a 250 kilogram obstacle and now the lever needs to be positioned in another way. So, the key idea is to treat the assembly problem as a constraint satisfaction task, where the object and the robot poses have to satisfy design constraints, for instance, a lever being placed on a fulcrum and the contact in load, and robot constraints, where the contact point is within the reachable space of the robot, is the robot is in a stable posture, and the force, it can apply the necessary force into the system, and the assembly should be collision free. Once all the constraints are accumulated, they can be treated with a nonlinear optimization approach, and the feasible uh, configuration for the robot and the objects can be determined. Um, in the interactive session, I'd like to talk to you more about the high-level planner, and the representation of the object and the robot con constraints, and different examples of this uh, approach, such as ramps and bridges. Finally, I'd like to dedicate this work to Mike Stillman, um, who passed away uh, tragically in May, um, my former advisor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jan Feigl, and I am from Czech Technical University in Prague. And together with Geoff Horninger from Oregon State University, we address the multi-goal path planning in uh, autonomous data collection. 
So the problem is basically to find a cost-efficient path to collect data from some redeployed set of sensor stations, which can be formulated as well-known traveling cell problem. However, there are two important aspects that can be considered for uh, practical mission deployment, and not only for our motivational example of uh, data collection from uh, sampling station located on the ocean floor, but also in other scenarios. So the first one is that we can consider the communication radius. So we don't need to reach the locations exactly, but we can retrieve data from some certain distance, which actually is the traveling salesman problem in neighborhoods. The second aspect is related to spatial proximity of the sampling stations. So we don't need to collect all data from all stations, but we just need to pick up the most important ones. And this can be addressed by price collecting traveling salesman. Altogether, we formulate the autonomous data collection, or in particular, multi-code path planning for that, as a price collecting traveling sales and problem with neighborhoods. And for that, we address, uh, we propose the solution based on a new unsupervised learning technique, which is based on a self forensic map for traveling sales and problem with neighborhoods. It was proposed three years ago. So we introduce new adaptation loop to select important sampling stations. And regarding the current state of the art and uh, Similar approaches, mostly based on computer heuristics, they they are strictly focused on some on some particular cases like TSP or PCTSP price collecting processing. And in the case of uh, TSP with neighborhoods, we are able to solve particular cases with some specific shapes of goals. On the other hand, this novel unsupervised technique is able to solve all these classes of these problems in the same way, in a unifying way. Regarding our results, we consider a couple of these scenarios, but mostly we are <coughs> considering the ocean uh, observatory synthetic endurance array scenario, and for which uh, you can see the performance of this unsupervised learning technique or overcome the current existing solutions. But what is also nice that regarding the computational uh, efficiency, this solution is uh, much more uh, faster. So it's not only provide best uh, better solution, but also uh, in less computation time. So if you are interested in uh, this approach, we can provide you any details and also our future work on how this technique can be extended to multi-robot scenarios. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Palmer. I'm from the Australian Centre for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. Uh, today I'll be presenting my work on stochastic collection and replenishment optimization for persistent autonomy. So the SCAR scenario consists of multiple user agents, a replenishment agent, and a replenishment point. User agents are a heterogeneous fleet of agents which have some capacity of a resource like fuel, battery charge, or uh, storage space. And they use this resource over time to operate. The replenishment agent also has a capacity of this resource and travels around to the user agents in the field to replenish them to keep, allow them to operate persistently. Uh, periodically, the replenishment agent must return to the replenishment point to itself be filled back up. Existing methods for optimizing this scenario uh, take a fairly short-term approach to optimizing it. Uh, so typically, they don't consider replenishing user agents multiple times. Um, they have a finite capacity for the replenishment agent. And another thing that they tend to ignore is that they or they tend to treat the uh, problem as deterministic. So in our approach, uh, we take into account all these considerations in a combinatorial optimization to come up with the schedule for the actions of the replenishment agent. And in this paper, we compare uh, two different objective functions, a total weighted tardiness and a tardiness ratio objective function. The total weighted tardiness uh, is essentially just minimizing the total time that the user agents are empty, whereas the tardiness ratio normalizes this with the number of user agents and the total schedule time. We've also tested both deterministic and stochastic versions of these uh, objective functions. Uh, so a deterministic one just uses mean parameter values, whereas the stochastic one uses the entire probability generation to generate an expected cost. Uh, they were tested on uh, this schedule shown here with uh, between four and six user agents and all of the uh, agents starting with initial resource values of between 50 and 100%, and the replenishment agents starting at the replenishment point. The results for the four user agent scenario are shown here. Uh, as you can see, the uh, ratio objective function typically outperforms the uh, tardiness objective function, and the stochastic 
forms of each objective function uh, outperformed the deterministic ones. Uh, and so I've just highlighted the stochastic ratio, which had the best results of all the uh, objective functions tested. Uh, so uh, please come visit me in the interactive session and I can give you any more information that you'd like. Thanks. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about coverage planning with finite resources and the motivation for this work is the fact that these uh, floors of all these commercial buildings are cleaned every night uh, by these machines operated by humans that cover potentially all the floor that needs to be cleaned. This is an over a billion dollar kind of a year industry to have these cleaning services uh, in all the commercial buildings. So coverage planning has been uh, one of the topics of study of robotics and a lot of work has been done on this area and it basically consists of uh, computing a, pl a, pl a path, plan for a path, in which the robot covers all the points in a given map. And uh, one of the ways is to actually decompose the map into cells and regions that are easily covered by simple back and forth uh, motions. And so whatever shape of the, the, the space there is and whatever obstacles there are, with this decomposition, which was introduced uh, by uh, Howard Chauzet and uh, Pignon, uh, you can then plan routes. You have to solve the problem of route planning between these multiple cells. What we have done in our work is that we have extended this to actually uh, include a battery constraint because the theoretical work uh, done on coverage planning assumes robots can go forever. The real robots have battery constraints, and therefore we added that to this algorithm. We call it the BC sweep algorithm. And basically, we add one more kind of like the station where the recharging station to a map, and then we use heuristics to compute the routes, travel salesman kind of problem routes uh, that allow the robot to compute how to traverse, how to cover the, the space. Here is an example. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that this space, which is a real layout of a building, is covered with one sweep. If the sweep is 800 units, this is an example of a sweep. And then if you have less units, 350, of course the, 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 the algorithm generates a different uh, coverage plan. And if the stations are in different locations, I just need you to look at the colors of this map that says how which locations are being uh, planned for. And then uh, you can come to the interactive session and I'll explain, hopefully in more depth, the algorithm which the paper explains. And I'll also show you examples in quite challenging environments such as this one that are well uh, handled by the algorithm and uh, the space is covered. Nothing of these still runs on the real robot. So this is a theoretical study of coverage planning with battery constraints. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Karthik Talamadupala, and uh, I'm going to talk today about our work on uh, uh, producing coordination in human-robot teams uh, using mental modeling and plan recognition methods. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Gordon Briggs and uh, Professor Matthias Scheutz at uh, Tufts University and uh, Tathagata Chakravarti and uh, Suprao Kamampati at uh, Arizona State. Uh, so the genesis of this work was basically in this idea that agents have beliefs and intentions which can be represented formally. And so an interesting corollary of that is that an agent can model its team members' beliefs and intentions. And often that's useful. So in this particular case, it's useful when you can use that information to predict the upcoming plans of team members. And obviously, as you can see, this will help in coordination. Now, obviously, if you're trying to predict plans, then uh, one idea is to use all of the work in the field of automated planning or high level or task level planning. Now, uh, there's been a lot of work on using uh, planning techniques for high level plan synthesis. And a lot of this work can also be used in order to simulate an agent's plan uh, based on the information that is known. 
And uh, as, a, as an example of the mapping that we use, uh, the initial state would just be all of the known beliefs of a particular agent. The goal formula would be the all of the known goals of that agent. And the action model would be a precondition effect style action model. And so an example, this is the running example in our paper, is basically you see that the agent we're interested in modeling is Commander X over there. And the agent's goal is given over there to actually go and perform triage in that room with a medical kit. And so when we throw it to the planner, this is the sort of predicted plan for that agent that comes out. Now, obviously, one question worth asking is what happens if you have incomplete knowledge or incomplete information? Um, so for example, what if we don't know all of the goals of our team members, which is often the case? Uh, in that kind of scenario, uh, plan recognition techniques are useful. So in this case, consider that we don't actually know the goal of Commander X beforehand. So it could be one of these two goals. It could be that the commander is going to conduct triage in room one or in room five. And uh, these are the observations that you get piecemeal. So you don't get all of this at once. You get these observations in the order shown. And this graph basically shows your belief in these two goals. So let me tell you beforehand that the goal that the commander is actually going to perform is the goal listed in blue. And you can see how the agent's belief, the robot's belief changes based on the number of observations that come in. An interesting variant of this scenario is uh, so if I go back, there's no divider between Hall 4 and Hall 5 over here. But in this, in this new version, there is actually a division. And you can see that there, the kink that was there in the previous graph is eliminated. And the agent's belief just goes up monotonically. Uh, I will be present in the interactive session. Uh, come look for me, and uh, we can talk further about automated planning. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Enea Shoni from University of Leuven and University of Ferrara. And today with my colleagues, we investigate about task specification using constraints. So for us, a task is a set of constraints. Then to generate uh, uh, a motion, we have to solve a constraint optimization problem. This approach is instantaneous. That means that even for a simple application like uh, a pick and, play, uh, pick and play scenario, where we have a robot, we have an object that we have to collect, and then we have a place here where we want to drop the object, means that you have a sequence of discrete steps where for each step we have a different constraint optimization problem to solve with different constraints and different parameter intention. That means that it would be nice if we can put those constraints together, so more constraints in the same problem, but if we keep go ahead, uh, we are always going to get uh, some constraint conflicting. In this case, for instance, we are asking explicitly to the robot to go to the peak area and the place area simultaneously in the same time. That's not possible. So it would be very nice to merge activities uh, and have then a concurrent task uh, uh, execution, but some constraints are conflicting. So how we can detect that and what we can do if we detect that and if we still um, uh, adapt the, the, our objective function. So the key idea is adding a knowledge that is missing in the task specification and then monitor this knowledge. So to make it short, as knowledge we have that we want to introduce here, we have the concept of quality of service for a task. Plus, we have also the concept of tolerances, which not always uh, is considered. But tolerances in time and in space. Thanks to that, monitoring this online, we can actually decide if we want to execute an additional task or not. I will give you uh, additional information during the interactive session. Just I want to spend a few seconds more talking about what I mean with tolerances in space. For instance, if you want to go to the peak area, we can define uh, a tolerance around it, uh, and we don't care to uh, reach exactly that frame. Same thing if you have a path. We don't have to follow the path uh, uh, at 100%, but most of the time, it's fine if you can deviate from it. So in the meantime, you can do something else. To make it short, as um, results, we have that we, our approach, we can actually exploit robot redundancy and reduce the global time, uh, global execution time. So um, if you want to get more information about uh, our approach, uh, please come uh, and see me in the, during the iterative section. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Jae Yong Sung from Cornell University. I'm going to talk about how to synthesize manipulation sequences 
for underspecified tasks using unrolled Markov random fills. This is joint work with Bart Selman and Ashutosh Saxena. So in this paper, we address the problem of sequencing manipulation and navigation controllers, given the environment and the task. For example, for the task of pouring object 17, it has to infer a sequence of bringing a cup to the table and pouring the coke. The symbolic planners based on strips or PDDL are already capable of doing this. However, it is often difficult to satisfy all of its requirements. The classic planners would require encoding preconditions and postconditions of every action, as well as giving the explicit goal state. And most importantly, it requires symbolic representation of the environment. What if object labels are not available, but rather objects are represented as a set of attributes, which is much more reliable to obtain as shown previously in the vision community. So what are some of the challenges? <clears throat> when humans give a task to robots, users often underspecifies the task to be performed. So for example, while the task is only referring to the one object code, the object robot actually has to interact with other objects like cup, table, or the coke can. And sequencing is environment dependent. Uh, depending on the environment, the first four steps of bringing the cup from the high shelf to the table may not be necessary. Or you might need even longer table sequence. If, if there is another object blocking the cup on the shelf, the robot needs to move the other object first. Finally, the output space is exponentially large. At each time step, if you have 10 controllers, and like if you have 20 objects in the environment, they're already with two parameters, you already have 4,000 possibilities. So for inferring the full sequence, it becomes exponentially large. We take a dynamic planning approach to the problem where there are a lot of if statements in the, fourth, in the loop. And we show that we can make it very simple and general by converting it into a feature-based representation. And finally, it can be represented as a model isomorphic to mark a random field, which we can train from a lot of different example sequences. We test our model on 127 sequences or 113 unique scenarios for five different underspecified tasks, such as stirring and pouring. And we have shown that it can correctly sequence 70% of the time and now performs other algorithms. By using these tasks, we have also shown that it can be used to form even higher level tasks, such as serving the sweet tea. Um, for more information, please come to the interactive session. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is my name is oh, my name is Jayan Lee, a PhD student in the University of Texas at Dallas. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about our research on path planning. Uh, we have been developing a uh, probability-based path planning. In this work, we propose a new method to overcome a drawback of the probability-based path. Uh, because the stochasticity exists in any system, uh, we can consider it in path planning stage. Uh, the stochasticity can be observed in this uh, non-holonomic system to fill the kinematic cart in 2D space and uh, zero of a flexible needle in 3D space. Uh, this shows the path of probability algorithm that uses the uh, system's stochasticity and associated probability. Uh, the main idea is uh, uh, quite simple that the intermediate path is determined so that the uh, targeting probability of future paths is maximized. Uh, a series of intermediate paths will form the optimal path uh, eventually. Uh, however, it has one drawback that uh, Intermediate path uh, is chosen from a finite and discrete set of uh, candidate paths. Therefore, uh, as shown here, uh, the uh, resulting path is not smooth enough, and sometimes it fails to hit the target properly. So uh, to improve it, we uh, apply fuzzy logic system to the classical path algorithm. Uh, this shows an interesting example of the fuzzy logic system. It can tell us how much we should pay uh, how much we should pay a tea based on the service and food quality in a restaurant. Uh, it, uh, wait, okay. uh, uh, to, uh, to apply the fuzzy logic system to, to fuzzy logic system with the pop algorithm to our examples, uh, we define the uh, if then rules and output membership function as shown here, and the input member Input membership function is defined as the uh, uh, targeting probability of the future path with a uh, uh, candidate intermediate path. 
uh, this shows the result. Uh, as you can see that the, uh, by using the proposed method, uh, we can generate a more uh, smoother path and hit the target more closely in both example with and without obstacle. Uh, if you need more, uh, if you need more details, please come to the interactive session. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Kevin Vicencio, and today I'll be presenting the research I worked on with my advisors for redundant robotic systems. So oftentimes in these systems, it is necessary to minimize a path. This is commonly done using the traveling salesman's problem with neighborhoods, which seeks to minimize a path between given regions. However, the main limitation for this model is that it is difficult to account for non-convex or non-connected neighborhoods. Therefore, the main contribution of this work was to combine the generalized traveling salesman's problem defined on graphs with the previously mentioned TSPN. The new formulation's name is called the generalized traveling salesman's problem with neighborhoods, in which each node can be located within different neighborhoods, and these different neighborhoods are grouped together to be known as neighborhood sets. Non-convex regions can then be modeled by dividing them into smaller convex regions. This is the mixed integer disjunctive programming formulation of the GTSPN. The main thing to take away from this is the third constraint as highlighted, which forces that the configuration can be located within, in any of the neighborhoods within a given neighborhood set. This problem is extremely complex and to solve to optimality. So therefore, we use a genetic algorithm procedure to solve for near optimal tours. To the right, we have a simple GTSPN instance, and to the bottom, we have our method for coding the chromosomes for these tours. In addition, we also included heuristics to further improve the tour. In order to investigate what could poss possibly make the solution procedure better, we looked into two different crossover operators, a uniform crossover and a unique arithmetic average crossover. However, it was determined that the uniform crossover was more computationally efficient. In addition, we did an overall performance evaluation of the genetic algorithm, and it was proven that it was consistent when determining a tour within, pl for, within plus or minus 0.59% for three-dimensional instances and plus or minus 0.27% for seven-dimensional instances. This is an example of a three-dimensional instance for those simulations. And as for future work, imagine we would like to visually inspect this building using an unmanned aerial vehicle. A degree of redundancy is introduced into the system when the vehicle can be located in almost an infinite amount of locations in order to, in order to, um, in order to take a picture of a single feature. Uh, this is uh, this instance modeled with the genetic algorithm executed for it. I'd love to talk with you more about the research, so please come visit me at my interactive session. Okay. So, hi, I'm Juan Cortez from La Cineres in Toulouse, France. And the work I'm going to present was mainly done by my PhD student, Didier Devors, in the context of the European project ARCAS. So, the, the problem we address can be seen as an off road version of the traveling statesman pro problem, in which the, the path for connecting pairs of states and the coast associated to this path was, is not known a priori. So uh, to solve this problem, we need to explore uh, continuous cost space uh, that, that is illustrated here in this simple two-dimensional uh, case where the cost of states is represented by their elevation. So the problem can be uh, decomposed into two sub-problems, a low-level problem to find connections between per pairs of states, and this can be formulated as a cost-based fast planning problem and a high-level problem to find the optimal order to, uh, to, um, to visit these states. And this is a, a classical combinatorial optimization problem. So these two, uh, two sub-problems can be interleaved and, and solved in a, an any-time manner using the method we propose. 
So the method that we have called the Anytime Multi-TRT algorithm, algorithm performs it in two stages. So first, entries are built uh, using the TRT algorithm from, from the given states until all the trees are connected. And this gives a, a suboptimal solution that can be uh, improved using uh, an Anytime Cycle Addition Procedure uh, that guarantees uh, a synthetic converge convergence to the global optimum. So these, these cycles in the graph uh, improve locally the, the, the paths, the local paths connecting the states. And these local improvements uh, change uh, the, the overall solution provided by the TSP uh, solver. So uh, we have uh, applied this method to several academic problems and compared it to, to other uh, methods and all the results are in the paper. We have also applied it to more realistic problems like the one illustrated in, the, in this figure uh, in which a uh, quad rotor is used for, for the inspection of uh, an industrial installation. So the, the quad rotor has to visit a, a set of given uh, waypoints uh, and then the goal is to find a short path uh, that uh, at the same time tries to maximize uh, clearance for safety reasons. So the solution was found in, in a few seconds and near, a near optimal solution in, uh, in one minute. So I will send you, I will send you other examples and I will ask your questions during the uh, session. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Gamble. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto, and this is work I do with my supervisor, Professor Tim Barfoot, and Professor Sid Srinivasa of Carnegie Mellon. It's an algorithm we call informed RT star, which is an extension of RT star. So RT star asymptotically finds the optimal path from the start to the goal, but it does this by asymptotically finding the optimal path from the start to every other state in the planning domain. This is obviously inefficient if using RT star for single query planning. Ideally, what you'd like to be able to do is use your current solution to define a sub-planning problem that contains any possibly better solutions, and then search only that sub-planning problem. That both improved the convergence rate of RRT star, as well as increased the probability of finding passages through narrow gaps, like the small one shown here. The nice thing about problems seeking to minimize path length is that this sub-problem is well-defined. It's described exactly by a shape known as a prolate hyperspheroid, which is an n-dimensional ellipse that's symmetrical about the tra transverse axis. Obviously, uh, at each iteration of the RT star, to improve your solution, you need to add a state from inside this ellipse. And the prob do probability of doing so will depend on the relative volume of the ellipse to the domain from which you're drawing your samples. So for example, if you have a large planning problem or a really good solution where your ellipse is small, you're gonna have a low probability of improving your solution. It also becomes a problem in high dimensions, as the probability of sampling the ellipse depends, um, even from a tightly bounding rectangle, as shown here, will depend on the state dimension n, and that probability goes to zero very quickly because there's a gamma function in the denominator. So in our paper, we present a method to directly sample this ellipse uniformly and uh, simply. Uh, this means that at each iteration, you're generating states that could improve the solution, and that you're focusing your search only on the path from the start to the goal. This makes a simple and computationally inexpensive way to improve the convergence rate of the RRT star that works regardless of state dimension. It's of, um, it can be added to existing RT star uh, implementations with a very small amount of work. It's flexible enough to be used in uh, conjunction with other path smoothing techniques like path smoothing or path shortening. Uh, and in situations where uh, the ellipse is larger than the planning domain, um, it work, informed RT star performs the same as RT star. So here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of RT star and informed RT star, seeking to find a path of equivalent cost using the same pseudo-random seed. You can say that, see that informed RT star finds that path a lot faster, and that's essentially because informed RT star has to search a much smaller problem than RT star. For those who are interested, uh, we're working on an OMPL implementation of this algorithm that will be released very shortly, uh, and you can find information about that on our website. Uh, and obviously, uh, I have an interactive session after this, and I'd love a chance to talk to you uh, about this more uh, if you'd like. Thank you. Great. Hello, my name is Michael Jenkin, and I'm from York University in Canada, and I'm here to present some work uh, that was done primarily by Jing Yang, who was my PhD student, who is now at Amazon. So we've had a little bit about improving uh, uh, path planning for complex tasks. So here's sort of the worst version of that. This is a 15 DOF um, path planning problem for a tentacle robot operating in a hot cell in a nuclear power plant. Um, 
Path planning is a reasonably tractable problem for small DOF environments. For large DOF environments, this is no longer true. And uh, deterministic solutions give way to probabilistic ones. So the problem with that is that the probabilistic solutions, although they may be correct, are not necessarily practical. So here's a solution obtained with a standard toolkit. The tool gets to the, the final goal, but it makes a large number of uh, excess motions on the way there. Um, it may move close to objects. Essentially, what you have is a mechanism that, that, that meets the hard constraints of the problem, but not the soft constraints of the problem. So the way in which this is normally addressed is to optimize the path to try to take the various soft constraints uh, into account. But there's a large number of possible optimizers you can choose. And what we want to look at here is how can you, in an in a informed way, take all the possible optimizations and apply them to the task. So um, what this work does is it assumes um, not that you know how to solve each one of the optimizers, uh, evaluate each one of the optimizers, but rather that each one of the optimizers tells you whether or not it's going to do a good job. And so we assume that there's an oracle associated with each optimizer, and each that oracle then bids in each round of an optimization process to see which one is going to actually get the chance of optimizing the task. And what you're seeing there in the video is the output of the optimization of the, of the previous path, which you might agree is a little smoother and farther away from obstacles in the environment. So the winning optimizer wins and is applied to the task, that is the, the optimizer whose uh, who's, uh, oracle bids wins, and then each one of the optimizers then takes that information, that is which one it won and how much optimization it actually did, and uses that to update their own uh, utility function. And so what happens is, although only one optimizer is run, each one of the utility functions gets updated as a function of time. And so that turns out to be really quite a useful thing. Here's a result from that example that was just shown there. Um, you can imagine that at every point in the optimization, you could have chosen the worst one, the best one with, say, a one-head look, look ahead, or the one chosen from the various utility functions. And that's what's plotted there. And you can see that the, um, the utility function mechanism worked rather well. I'd be happy to talk uh, more about this in the uh, interactive section afterwards. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Akishiko from Tokyo University. And the author cannot be here because of the flight trouble. And uh, I am making a presentation on behalf of him. So starting with the problem setting, we assume that we are giving a discretized reference trajectory, which, however, cannot be followed because of the obstacles shown in red in the past. And what we want now is a new trajectory that does not collide with the obstacles and resemble the reference trajectory in terms of velocity and acceleration. In mathematical term, this can be described by this cost function E, which is a weighted sum of all the sampling points of the acceleration and velocity deviation between the original reference trajectory and the new trajectory. In order to find such a solution, we create a tree in task space using a sampling-based incremental search algorithm, more specifically IRT star, and by a solution of this tree toward an optimal solution. And the trick is now that we can calculate an optimal solution at least for the unconstrained case using the Laplacian trajectory editing, which is a method shown in the paper. And we use this solution for the unconstrained case as a task space bias for the constrained case in order to shift possible solutions towards those optimal solutions. So looking at the picture on the right side, you see a specific example in 2D where a reference trajectory in orange collides with obstacles along its path. And in blue, you see that resulting RRT star tree, and it is visible that every branch of tree is some degree resembled to the shape of the original reference trajectory. And as we create such a tree, we find an optimal trajectory in green with a similar velocity and acceleration profile. Yet this new optimal trajectory is non-colloid. We also perform some experiment using HRP4, where we lift a cup from under the table onto the table. And the original movement fails because the robot is collided with the stack of the books. The reparation RRT star 
imitation successfully press the cup onto the table without colliding with it. So please come to our poster if you are interested in. Thank you. Uh, this work focuses on quality analysis for distributed motion planning roadmap. Uh, in motion planning, we're interested in sequence of motion that takes a, mo a robot from a given configuration to a good configuration. The exact solution to this problem is known to be intractable, and this has been known for several decades. Uh, but there are approximate solutions that works well in practice. Uh, but our focus uh, in this work, we're talking about parallel motion planning, and the question is, what's motivation for this? Uh, one of the key motivation is that complex and large-scale problems test the limit of sequential planners. Uh, you can think about industrial robots on the factory floor or talk about multi-agent systems. And of recent, people have been talking about cloud robotics. But the good news is that parallelism has become mainstream. Uh, there are distributed machines all around us. And um, we also know that some, including multi-core robot systems. So this is good news that we can leverage on and take advantage of. So previously, we proposed a scalable framework for parallelizing sampling-based motion planning. At high level, this is a four-step approach. It starts with dividing the planning space into regions, and we construct a region graph, which is an abstraction of relationship between these regions. And having done that, the next thing you want to do is to concurrently build roadmaps in each of the regions using any of your sequential planners some of which have been mentioned previously. And lastly, we perform inter-region connection between neighboring regions. Uh, this approach has been shown previously that it scales well to a large scale problem. Uh, but the question is, what does the quality of the roadmap tell us? We know there may be differences in the structure. So our work here is to now systematically evaluate the differences in the structure and the impact of that on the quality of the solution that is obtained. And we apply some of the metrics that uh, are shown here from the number of edges to the query solve, not just solving the query per se, but what is the quality of the path and what is the diameter of the graph that you are dealing with. So we have all of these metrics and uh, what we observe in our result is that uh, the the, the graph may be different, but the quality of the result are comparable uh, to the sequential planner. And there are actually cases in which the parallel planner actually constructs a better roadmap compared to the sequential planner. There will be more details in the course of the interaction, so I ask that you please stop by the interaction session, and thank you so much for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Roy Oshua. I'm a PhD student at Baralan University. I'm going to talk about the problem of surface path adversarial coverage. This is a joint work with my supervisors, Noah Agumon and Gal Kameka. So basically, the robotic coverage problem, a robot needs to visit every point in a given area at least once. This problem is, uh, well, was well researched in the robotic literature. In iOS 13, we have introduced a new version of this problem, which is called robotic adversarial coverage, in which the area contains threat points. The robot must visit the threat points. However, the threat points can harm the robot and even completely stop its coverage mission. This problem has many real-world applications, such as demining and also exploration in hazardous fields. There are two goals we would like to achieve in this problem. First is to maximize survivability of the robot also to minimize the coverage time. Clearly, there is some trade-off between these two goals. In this paper, we discuss the problem of finding the safest coverage path that covers the area. Here you can see a sample map of the environment. We have three types of cells here. There are safe cells, which are called white. There are cells with dangerous points, which are called with purple, with different levels of threats. And there are cells that are blocked by obstacles. We can think of two objectives in this problem. One is to maximize probability to complete the coverage, and the other one is to maximize the expected coverage. We've shown that both variants of the problem are NP-complete. Therefore, we suggest two heuristic algorithms to solve this problem. 
The first one is based on spanning tree coverage. We first split the target area into different sub-areas. Each one belongs to a different threat level. And then we cover each sub-area in the order of the threat levels. The other approach uses a greedy approach, which moves the robot from its current location to the near surface cell, which hasn't been covered yet by the robot. We use Dask's algorithm to compute the surface draw. We've shown optimality bounds on both algorithms. In experiment results, we've shown that ESTAC provides higher expected coverage, while the greedy approach provides a lower accumulated risk. So in this work, we've introduced the surface coverage problem. We propose heuristic algorithms for solving it. I suggest you look at the paper for many more results and come to see my poster for any more information you would like to know. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Konstantinos Karaidis, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware. Uh, the objective of our work is to port planning methodologies to miniature legged robots, and today I'm going to present you an application of our goal to the novel robot STAR, which was designed at the University of California, Berkeley. So why are we interested in miniature legged robots? Well, first of all, they can be relatively inexpensive and rapidly produced, which in turn can allow for deployment in large numbers. Uh, additionally, legs, the presence of legs in the robot leads to increased mobility across varied terrains and, of course, given the scale of the robot. So, uh, these uh, robots, although very small, they demonstrate a very great potential in applications that involve search and rescue, building or pipe inspection. STAR is a, Star is a lightweight uh, 3D printed robot with a rimless wheels leg. It uses a differential drive steering mechanism for navigation and active sprawl control for regulating its sprawl angle. In principle, it combines the benefits of wheeled and leg locomotion. Now, in order to, to, to plan the motion of STAR, we require a model. And this model needs to capture the silent features of its behavior instead of being an accurate representation of uh, its design. And a good candidate to start with is uh, the unicycle model. And the reason for that is that if we show that the unicycle model is good for STAR, then you can use a variety of planning methodologies directly. Also, the same model was successful for uh, capturing the behavior of, of larger multi leg robots, including Rex. So the question that we ask at this point is, can we really say that the unicycle model is approximating the motion of STAR? And in order to... To answer this question, we conducted a series of experiments where the robot was configured to move straight, turn left, and turn right. Then, through this data, we, call, we identified motion primitives, which we saw that they can indeed be matched to those of a unicycle model. And finally, we used the primitives we constructed together with an LRT planner in order to navigate and construct paths in um, an environment populated with obstacles. Finally, we also saw that the validity of these results, we saw the validity of these results by experimenting with uh, the physical robot. So we saw that bringing, porting planning methodologies to the miniature scale is possible. However, there are some caveats which I would like to discuss with you during the interactive session. Thank you very much. <laughs> 